everyone here. Welcome to people on Zoom. If anyone's managed to tune in from the kind of middle to the west of the United States, this might actually be a dawn service, so well done for that. Um, and for those on Zoom, we are going to be sharing communion a bit later on in the service. Um, so you might want to grab some bread and some, uh, some juice so that you can share with us as we share at the Lord's table. Uh, as last week, we're no longer legally required to wear masks in our services, but we do recognise that some people are going to still want to. Our welcome team is going to stay wearing masks at least for the next few weeks. Um, and we're going to try and keep the back three rows or so uh, free for people who want to wear masks so they're not sitting in front of someone not wearing a mask. Um, so if you want to kind of suppress your church upbringing and not sit at the very back um, if you want to uh, have your mask off. And obviously at the end of the service, please be gracious to each other um, as you stand and chat. If the person you're chatting to is wearing a mask, then you might want to put one on as well. Um, otherwise it all gets a bit awkward. That all being said, it's amazing to be here on Easter Sunday. It's my first Easter here. It's wonderful to come and celebrate the fact that Jesus has risen again. Um, this morning we're going to do that. We're going to sing and rejoice in all that God has done. Um, and we're going to start this morning by singing, See What a Morning. the morning gloriously bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem folded the grave close to filled with light as the angels announce Christ is risen see God's salvation plan wrought in love born in pain paid in sacrifice fulfilled in Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are risen from the dead. Hallelujah. What a saviour. We come to rejoice in your name, to rejoice in what you have done, to give thanks that because you are risen, so too can we be. Because you died and came to life, we know that death has no hold on us, that the grave has no sting, we rejoice in all that that means for now, for our life here on earth and for eternity. And Lord, we rejoice because we know that it is not we who have done this. 
It is Christ. It is Christ who died our death. It is Christ who died that we might be forgiven, and we need your forgiveness, Lord Jesus, this morning. We do not come perfect. We do not come with lives of wonder, but lives that are still tainted by death. But you have died, that death may die, that sin may be forgiven, that our lives may be as yours, washed, clean, perfect. And then you rose, that we might rise, that we might live forevermore. And that, that is something worth singing about. That is something worth rejoicing. That is something worth proclaiming. And so we come this morning, Lord, and we sing your praises. We rejoice in our salvation. We remember what you have done on that cross and what it means for our lives here and now that you are risen. You are alive and you meet with us this morning and we pray, Lord, your spirit would come and remind us again, not just that Christ has risen, but that Christ is risen and that Christ will come again. So Lord, be with us here this morning. Anoint us, capture our hearts, loosen um, our tongues and our minds and set us free to worship you in all truth, in all freedom. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We all have our favourite films and stories. Maybe you had a, fa a favourite uh, fairy tale as a child, or maybe uh, you prefer superhero films um, and, and what we find actually is that a lot of these stories and a lot of these films they follow a same kind of pattern same kind of things happen and, and really what, what every story whether or not it's a fairy tale or it's a superhero film or it's anything else so many of them we watch because they start once upon a time and they finish happily ever after but actually what makes those films interesting is what happens in between Once Upon a Time and Happily Ever After. That's what makes them a good story. And we're going to watch a video now that thinks a little bit about what happens when you tinker with that story. If we watch the video. I think we all want a happy ending. And the happy ending that we want is found in Jesus. Not just because he died, but because he rose again. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the greatest story ever told. For the hero who laid down his life. But was brought back to life for us. The greatest story ever told. And it is true for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We are going to sing uh, of that great story, the greatest day in history.
Thank you, Noel. Um, we're going to have, well, something that we haven't done before. We're going to sing, but we're gonna, I'm going to invite, we've got a choir this morning, and we're going to sing in Christ alone, but they're going to sing the first verse, I think it's Swahili, and then the second verse is going to be in Mandarin. Feel free to join in if, uh, if you are gifted in that way. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sing the second two verses in English. I'm just going to rearrange the furniture a bit, and then we'll, we will sing together. Thank you to Sarah in particular for all the hard work and all the other guys who've been in practicing for that this morning. That was great. Um, earlier on, obviously, we watched a video uh, with Beauty and the Beast, and the ending was cut short, and it ruined the story. One of the tragedies often at Easter is that we do 
uh, we do things the other way around. We move from the Hosannas of Palm Sunday to the risen Christ of Easter Sunday with nothing in between. We skip straight from Belle dreaming of adventure to marrying a prince and there is no beast in sight. So as we come today to rightly celebrate the joy of our risen Lord, we must also enter into the joy, and it is a joy, of his brutal death. And we do this as we share communion together, a simple reminder of both his death and his resurrection. It's, it's here that we recognize our need for a hero, for a savior, we recognize that we ourselves have done nothing to be deserving of God's mercy, but that Jesus himself did everything that was required and took our punishment upon himself on the cross. And it is here that we join those early disciples in declaring he is risen, that we have a Lord who is living today, who moves today whose impact is felt in the world today, who makes a difference in our lives today. All who choose to come are welcome here. No one comes because they deserve it. It's not a prize for being good, for following the rules. We come only because we trust in Jesus, because we need his forgiveness. Jesus shared that first communion with all of his disciples. Hours later, they would run away. Peter would deny him three times. And even Judas, who would betray him, shared in that supper. And so none are excluded. But it's also a choice that we make and not one that should be entered into lightly. And so as I prepare for communion, prepare yourselves to receive the elements, the bread and the wine. And don't take them if you're not ready. Jesus on that night when he was betrayed. He took bread and he gave thanks to God. He broke it and he spoke these words. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. And then after they had eaten their meal together, he took the cup and he said that this cup is the new covenant, which is sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. And so today, in the same way, I take ordinary things, we've dressed them up in silver, but they are simple, ordinary things. And we set them apart for a holy and mysterious use. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that these ordinary things mean to us on this day. That ordinary bread should remind us of your body, beaten and broken on the cross, dying our death in our place. That an ordinary cup of juice should remind us of the new promise that you have made with us, freedom with you purchased by your blood. And Lord, we're not, we're not able in our dullness to understand the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your love. But true to the commandment you gave, we come to this table, which you have left for us to be used in remembrance of your death until you come again. 
And here we declare and witness before the world that by you alone we have received liberty and life. By you alone we are claimed as children and heirs. By you alone we have access to your favour, freely shown. By you alone we are raised into your spiritual kingdom. So we pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit here today, that he would be on these simple things, that they may be for us your body and blood, that you would be on us, that we might be your family here in the world today, that he would be in us, that we might know once again that true freedom is found only in you. And gather your church together, Lord, especially on this day, as we particularly remember your resurrection, that we, with all your people of every language, race, and nation, may share this meal together, putting our sides on, aside our differences in a declaration that we share, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And we join too in the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. To remember Jesus and in obedience to what he told his disciples to do, we do this. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. And so, take, eat. This is the body of Christ, which is for you. Do this remembering him. This cup is the new covenant sealed by Christ's blood, which was shed for the sins of many, that they might be forgiven. Drink from it, all of you. May the peace of God be upon you. Let's sing once more. Oh, to see the dawn.
So we're in our penultimate week of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. I hope you have enjoyed the journey that we've been on um, through all of its uh, complications and questions and difficult bits, but some really (coughs) uplifting bits I find as well, and some challenge as we continue to ask ourselves, what what does it mean to be church? to be the gathering of God's people. Um, And so we get really now to the the, the final two sections, two bits. Um, And we arrive, not by coincidence, um, into chapter 15 this morning, which speaks of Christ's resurrection. So we're going to read together from chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 49. We'll save the last bit for next week. So, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Now, 
brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since death came through a man the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man for as in adam all die so in christ all will be made alive but each in turn christ the first fruits then when he comes those who belong to him then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of god the father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of, of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and stars, the star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. 
The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have been born the image of the earthly man, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Amen. There we go, there's quite a lot in there. But let's start with the important bit, the first importance, the bit that matters more than anything else. Number one, Christ died for our sins. Number two, Christ was raised from the dead. And in fact, if you forget everything else I say, you remember nothing else, remember this. If you remember those two things, that's it, you can forget everything else I'm about to say. This is of first importance. The rest of it doesn't matter. This is the important bit. Now, for, the, for Paul and for the church in Corinth in particular, it was also important to say that these things were done according to the scriptures. And Paul, as a, a Jew, recognized the importance of preaching from scripture. And so this was fundamentally true. But actually, really, these two things are the things that matter more than anything else. He says, look, if these things are not true, then everything else is meaningless. All of Christianity hangs on this. Nothing else matters until we are satisfied of the truth of this. Now, obviously, some had been coming into the church in Corinth and teaching that the resurrection of the dead doesn't happen. That, and perhaps from what is said here, that they were teaching that, well, you know, Jesus was raised from the dead, but he was special. No one else gets raised from the dead. Now, it's possible this is under the influence of a Jewish sect called the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the afterlife. As the saying goes, they didn't believe in heaven, and that made them Sadducee. Uh, that's how I always remember it. Um, but whatever was happening, they were saying, look, actually, people don't get raised from the dead. When they die, that's it. I says, no. No, if there's no life after death, then we are, of all people, most to be pitied. Paul is aware that the life of a Christian is not an easy life, but the promise of new life, the hope of resurrection, encourages us to persevere. He talks about being in Ephesus, he talks about facing death daily. He says, how could I face death daily if there was not hope of something after? And actually, if there is no resurrection of the dead then there is no hope for us. We are to be pitied. What a ridiculous decision to make, to put your life in danger, to upend everything that perhaps you were holding dear, to follow Jesus only for it to end in death. He says that's pointless. It's meaningless. But, he says, but, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And so there is great hope for us, an eternal hope. That actually this life is but a, a waiting room for the life to come. And, and that Christ's resurrection confirms to us that it is coming. That Christ was a man, fully man, raised from the dead. And because he was raised, we can go, do you know what? Because he was raised, so can I be. It's coming. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister during the Second World War, uh, wrote this in his diary. I think we've got the quote um, up there. So, I'm not going to do the accent. If Tim was here, I'd, well, he's just, I probably could get him to come through, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so, we had won after all. We had won the war. 
No doubt it would take a long time. Many disasters, immeasurable cost and tribulation lay ahead, but there was no more doubt about the end. Being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. He wrote this in December 1941, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, three and a half years before the war finally came to an actual end. Christ's resurrection was an attack on death itself. The war is won. There will continue to be skirmishes to this day, but the end is confirmed, the victory is assured, and Christ is the proof. Christ died. Christ rules again. Now, we get into, this is to help you remember, okay? We get into this weird section about the baptism for the dead. So a quick word on, on, on that there, in, uh, it starts in verse 29. Uh, now, if there is no resurrection, what will, we do, uh, what, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? Um, which sounds a bit strange to our ears, because it's a bit strange. Um, just to say, this is not a prescription of what we should be doing. This is uh, Paul describing what was happening in the church in Corinth. He's saying, you're doing this strange thing, but actually what you're doing in itself is contradicting the teaching that you've been given. Why bother being baptised for the dead, which is something you're doing, when you're saying, on the other hand, that, that the dead aren't raised to life? It's pointless. Why are you even bothering? He's pointing out the futility of doing this if they, if they did not believe in resurrection. But actually, what he's not saying is, we should be doing this. And no idea what it would look like if we even tried. There's nowhere in Scripture that recommends this as a practice, and there's plenty of reasons in Scripture to avoid it. But again, this is being spoken into a situation and he's pointing out um, again and as he has done in a number of places the futility of their arguments of saying one thing and doing another so we don't need to worry about baptizing for the dead and then we come into this section of, about the resurrection body and this is a, a subject often that is treated quite lightly but it's something that we really need to approach with care and sensitivity. Because actually, although it's, it's all very well to joke about looking forward to not having to wear glasses, uh, or perhaps having a bit more hair on our heads again, um, but for many people, the idea of a resurrection body raises some significant and quite existential questions. Because actually, we, we live in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a society where so many people are compartmentalised because of their bodies, particularly because of perceived imperfections. And so when it comes to the question of resurrection body, we have to ask some significant questions about those who are differently abled. The blind may see, the deaf may hear, the lame may walk. But what, are, what of those people for whom their earthly body is part of actually who they are. What of those with Down syndrome? What of those with other significant lifelong conditions, which they would see as part of who they are? If by saying your resurrection body does not have those things, are we saying that there is something about them that is not right? And actually, we, we live in a world that is increasingly imprisoning people with ideas of, of body perfection. And so are we just deepening the problem by talking of our perfect heavenly bodies? And perhaps even more worrying, we're living in a world that increasingly tries to separate soul and mind from body. Have we bought into this idea that our very selves, who we are, is somehow inserted into a body of meat that has no consequence, that has no part of us, and that in the resurrection our souls somehow just get pulled out of this and placed in something different? 
And this is a really dangerous line of thinking within our current kind of social climate. But more importantly, it's not a biblical reasoning. We find ourselves in a position where it's somehow too much and not enough. Yes, we will have a resurrection body, a heavenly body, a spiritual body. Um, we will have something in the life of the world to come. And it will, in some mysterious way, be other. But, but let's not be so simplistic as to think it's just a facelift. It's just a fixing of the things that we find problematic about our bodies. And let's not think that although it might be somehow other that it's not us, that this body we have here in this life is somehow just replaceable and that what, us, what is us is not just about soul and mind. It's still us. The picture that, uh, that is given is, is of the seed and the plant. Uh, to quote Andrew Wilson, who I've quoted a few times, my future body is to my current body what an oak tree is to an acorn. Identifiably the same, but greater to an unimaginable degree. I think it's a fantastic way of thinking about it. We know that an oak tree and an acorn are the same thing in different stages. This body we have here is an acorn and the body that we will have in heaven is an oak tree. They are the same thing. They are both equally important. You cannot extract the essence of an oak tree from an acorn and grow that tree. But an oak tree and an acorn, they're very different. I cannot throw one across the room, the other I can. They are different to an unimaginable degree and so will our future bodies. And that should be a thing to rejoice in. And so Christ has died and Christ was raised from the dead. Uh, people come often with all sorts of uh, questions and, and barriers they see um, to becoming a Christian. Sometimes they're confused about things in the Old Testament. They've got questions about creation or about the flood or about the battles in Canaan. Sometimes they have questions about scripture because they find things that they think are contradictory and they don't understand. Or they have questions about the character of God. And these are all important questions if you are a Christian. And they're definitely worth pondering if you want to mature in your faith. But they are actually meaningless until we have answered these questions. Did Christ die for our sins? Was Christ raised from the dead? Until you answer those questions, the rest of them are meaningless. They do not matter. If Christ was not raised, don't come back next Sunday. Any of you, whether it's your first time or you've been here for 50 years, if Christ was not raised, don't come back because it's meaningless. But it is true. Of that, I have no doubt. Christ died for your sins. Christ was raised from the dead in order that we too might be raised. What are we going to do about it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is rare to find a passage which so neatly sums up everything that is important. And yet here it is. You have died for our sins. You were raised from the dead. And so I have a hope, a hope that is beyond this life. Lord, I pray that today we will search ourselves and ask ourselves the question, did Christ die? Was he raised? Did this really happen? Can I know that it is true? 
that we would not avoid the question, that we would not look at the rest of Scripture, that we would not look at the world around us, but we would focus in and say, did Christ die for me? Was he raised for me? What will I do about that? And as for me, Lord, I will worship you, for I know that it is true. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Set out then on a new life with Christ, with the resurrection power of the Spirit imbuing you with everlasting hope and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>